so, Lord. That's our prayer. Pray that you would baptize us in wonder. Thank you, Lord, so much for um, Anthony and the worship team. And I, I thank you for everyone in this room and everyone that watches online or will watch online here or other places. I pray that you would baptize all of us in wonder. And Lord, I pray this for myself and for all of us. In fact, maybe silently in your heart you could pray this now after me. And, and that is, Lord, we ask that you would give us each um, a hearing heart. Maybe you could just ask that now in silence. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Have any of you ever seen that video? Yeah. Uh, that's a Washington, D.C. metro station. It was January 12th, 2007, 8 a.m. The fellow in the baseball hat playing the violin played for 45 minutes as 1,097 people passed by. Only six people stopped, and uh, most of them only for a moment. Many children stopped, but each time they did, their parents would quickly pull them back on task and make them keep moving. The violinist collected $32.17 from 27 people who passed by. Three days earlier, he had played the very same piece on the very same $3.5 million violin, but he had played it in a sold-out concert hall where the average price of a ticket was $100. The whole thing was videotaped as an experiment uh, hosted by the Washington Post to see how people interacted with beauty. The violinist was Joshua Bell, perhaps the most accomplished, well-known violinist in our country. The one woman that did recognize him had seen him in the concert hall. And she stopped, and she gave him a $20 bill, which was probably all that she had. I mean, maybe we're surrounded by music all the time. Maybe Jesus is playing in every metro station, at every bus stop, wherever you happen to be. He did say that the kingdom of heaven was at hand to the thief uh, next to him in the garden on the tree and in Calvary. He said, today, this day, you will be with me in paradise. That's Eden. Paul claimed that he was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, he just didn't know. So maybe we're surrounded by music, and Jesus is playing all the time, but until we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to know, we remain alone, in silence, that is, dead. Last time we preached about the day that Solomon and all Israel brought the ark into the temple on the holy mountain. And Solomon and all Israel sacrificed 22,000 ox and 122,000 sheep simply because they could not stop celebrating the fact that, his, that God is good and his steadfast love endures forever. It was a song that they were all singing. Just a few chapters before, in 2 Chronicles 1 and 1 Kings 3, we read about 
the incident that made Solomon, the son of David, into the uh, great king that he, that he was. This is 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. Apparently, the high places were high places, as in mountaintops, where the Canaanites had worshipped before the Israelites uh, took the land. You know, we all worship something or someone, right? Including ourselves. So when Israel conquered the land, they would use the old high places to worship Yahweh. And yet we discover that Yahweh wants them to worship him before the ark on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. God is everywhere, and yet he is not simply whatever we imagine him to be. So maybe it's important to see him in one place, like the concert hall, so that we would recognize him in every place and enjoy the music. Whatever the case, Yahweh comes to get Solomon at Gibeon, which was eight miles north of Jerusalem and Mount Zion and the ark. Verse 4, and the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you, and you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. I would suppose that by his throne, the author, probably Jeremiah, is referring to his father David's throne, but in 1 Chronicles 29, we read that Solomon sat on the throne of Yahweh. That's pretty cool. I just, anyway, verse 7, and now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, and your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multiply, mul multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding, shema is the verb, an understanding mind, uh, lab in Hebrew. Hebrew word lab however, is almost always translated heart. But here, the English Standard Version translates it as mind. And I would suppose that's due to the fact that this is the only way that Western, modern, supposedly enlightened people think they can understand or discern anything with their mind, right? And so Solomon isn't really asking to understand, though, with, with just his mind. The Hebrew verb shema is usually translated hear. As in hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your, your strength. That's Deuteronomy 6, 3, also known as the shema or the shema. Speaking to Gentiles, much later, a thousand years later, Jesus adds the word mind when they spoke Greek. But anyway, Solomon doesn't pray, give me an understanding mind to govern, he prays this, give me a hearing heart to govern. Shaphat, judge. Give me a hearing heart uh, to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. <laughs> wow, that should like get our attention, right? That phrase, good and evil. Although I couldn't even find a commentary that even really even mentioned this fact, but the term good and evil, at least in English Bibles, has only occurred four times so far in Scripture. In second, no, uh, five times so far, but only in two places. Second Samuel, a woman claims that David is like the angel of Yahweh, for he can discern between good and evil. And before that, we only find it in Genesis 2 and 3, where it's used four times referring to the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And the snake's temptation to Adam and Eve to take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then God's comment on Adam's and Eve's state as they're being driven from the garden, they are knowing good and evil. I mean, that should just get our attention, good and evil. So, so what is Solomon asking? In 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 10, Scripture records this very same incident, and this is what Solomon says. <laughs> Give me now wisdom 
and knowledge to go out and come in before the people for who can govern Shaphat, who can judge this people of yours, which is so great. Give me wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge of what, Solomon? Knowledge of good and evil. Solomon is asking for the knowledge of good and evil, and that should get our attention, right? For a whole bunch of reasons. Number one, when Adam and Eve took it from the tree in the garden at the evil one's direction, things just didn't go all that well. And they're still not going all that well. And that raises a question, number two. Why is Solomon asking for it now? Especially if supposedly he already has it. In Genesis 3, the Lord God says, Behold, the Adam has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. But, number three, even though Adam and Eve had it and died, as God said they would, in Deuteronomy, God reveals, like we've talked about, that little children don't have it. For he says that they aren't yet able to discern between the good, uh, they aren't able to discern the good from the evil, and yet they will discern, and they will also die. We've all eaten, and maybe do eat. And so if the, we take the Bible seriously at all, we ought to ask the question, what does this tree of the knowledge of good and evil look like? Jesus said God alone is good, and the whole New Testament reveals that Jesus is God in flesh. He's the revelation of God, and so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil must have looked something like this. Now, if you've been around the sanctuary for a while, you've seen this picture, right? In almost like every sermon. It's not because I'm into this artist, but because artists often see what scientists and theologians do not allow themselves to see. For scientists and theologians often render themselves incapable of wonder. I think this is what many in the early church saw. I think John and Paul saw this, that, that Jesus is the good in flesh, hanging on the tree, in the garden, at the boundary of the sixth and seventh day of creation, the boundary between space, time, and eternity. So isn't Solomon asking for fruit from this tree? Second Chronicles 1.10, give me now wisdom and knowledge. He's asking for knowledge of good and evil and wisdom. Now, check out just some of what Solomon wrote about wisdom, all right? Proverbs 3.18, she, wisdom, is a tree of life. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding or reason, he established the heavens. Proverbs 8.1, does not wisdom call? Does not understanding or reason raise her voice? So, well, I suppose you could have a, a male body with a with a female spirit. It seems that God does in the Old Testament. That's fascinating if you look at the tenses or the case or the gender of the nouns. But then Proverbs 8, 12, wisdom starts talking, saying, I, wisdom, find knowledge. As if wisdom is a person and knowledge is, is a thing. Then Proverbs 8, 22, the Lord possessed or fathered me, this is wisdom talking, the Lord possessed or fathered me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Proverbs 8, 30, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of Adam. Proverbs 8, 35, whoever finds me finds life. All who hate me love death. So through wisdom, God creates all things. And John tells us that through the logos, the word, God creates all things. So Jesus is the wisdom. Or logos, in flesh, like fruit on a tree. Proverbs 9.1, wisdom has built her house. 9.2, she has set her table. 9.5, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways, stupid ways, and live. Proverbs 3.18, she wisdom is a tree of life. So if we take the Bible seriously, we really ought to ask, what does a tree of life or the tree of life look like? Well, wouldn't the tree of life look like this, the same. 
You see, wisdom is kind of like living knowledge, right? Or knowledge that's alive. So I could gain knowledge of my wife, Susan, by dissecting her and analyzing all the parts. But then she'd be dead. And I'd only know about things like carbon, nitrogen, maybe her liver or kidneys or something. So I could take knowledge of my wife, or a million times better, I could be known by my wife and so know my wife, and then I know Susan the person. And she could tell me all about herself. And I'm guessing that might even be more fun. So wisdom is a tree, or the tree of life, that must look like the tree of knowledge. Jesus prayed, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing, life is knowing a person. In Genesis, the two trees grow in one spot in the middle of a garden on the holy mountain. Jesus hang on one, remember he hung on one tree between two trees in a garden on the holy mountain. So life is knowing him, but how do you know him? You could take his life, like Adam, but Solomon asks for wisdom and knowledge of good and evil, and check this out, God does not damn Solomon to hell but just the opposite. 1 Kings 3, verse 9. Solomon prays, Give your servant, therefore, a hearing heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this, your great people? What a great question. Who's able to do this? It pleased the Lord. Literally, it was good for the Lord. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to hear what is right, behold, now I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning heart so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. God gives him wisdom and all things with wisdom. And Paul writes, says, say, he's given us his own son. Will he not also with him give us all things? Do you see, God is just thrilled to give you all things. But first, you must learn to ask for wisdom. That is Jesus. That is the good, who is the life, the very presence of love. Verse 14, and if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes, and you know the rest of the story on this one, and my commandments as your father David walked, and and that's an interesting conversation too, Well, then he says, well, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem on Mount Zion and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. You see, God didn't cast him out of the garden. In fact, God actually sent him back to the garden, back to the concert hall on the holy mountain to stand before his presence, which would appear between the cherubim on the ark, the cherubim that guard the way to the the tree of life. Hopefully you remember. This is what we've been preaching on for the last uh, few months. And no, I know this may all seem like complicated, especially if you're new, but in one sense, it's all really quite simple. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul tells the Corinthians, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But then Paul goes on to talk about everything. He goes on to talk about all things, including the first Adam and the last Adam, the eschatos Adam, and that Jesus is our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, and that Jesus' death and resurrection, this is all in 1 Corinthians, that Jesus' death and resurrection is the end of the ages and the presence of eternal life. In other words, Jesus on that tree is there in the beginning and at the end and constantly sustains all of space and time. So Jesus Christ and him crucified is not simply the way you get a few sins you feel bad about forgiven in the past and then get your ticket punched so you can get into heaven. 
Jesus Christ and him crucified is the good and the life and the, 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 the wisdom in everything that's anything. And until you hear him, see him, and surrender to him, you haven't even heard the music or even yet begun to live. So Solomon stands before the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and the tree in the middle of the garden, and God gives him wisdom. And Solomon becomes wisdom incarnate. Prince of Peace. Next verse. Then two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. So just as Solomon stood before wisdom upon the Ark of the Covenant, Now two prostitutes stand before Solomon. Two prostitutes from one house. The one woman said, oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth on the third day. And we were alone. There was no one else with us in the house. Only we two were in the house, and this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your servant slept and laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, behold, he was not the child that I have born. But the other woman said, no, the living child is mine, and the dead child is yours. The first said, no, the dead child is yours, and the living child is mine. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead, and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought before the king, and the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman, whose son was alive, said to the king, because her heart, rakam, her womb, or compassion, yearned for her son, she said, oh my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. But the other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. Then the king answered and said, give the living child to the first woman, and by no means put him to death. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him. (laughs) Now notice that it doesn't say they perceived that Solomon was wise, but instead they perceived that the wisdom of God was in Solomon to do mishpat. Mishpat is good Shafat, that is good judgment. And so the ESV translates mishpat, or good judgment, as justice. So they perceived, that is, they saw, they did not judge the judge, but they recognized the judge. They perceived that the wisdom of God was in Solomon to do justice. What is justice? This is a statue of Lady Justice, and she kind of looks like a hooker. (laughs) I mean, she's got one breast hanging out of her toga, not that I'm complaining about that, but she's also got scales in her hands. Scales are the ancient equivalent of a cash register. She's holding a sword with a, with a blindfold, wearing a blindfold, so she makes judgment about people, but she cannot see people. Now, if she was only blind to what people covered themselves with, that might be helpful because then she wouldn't see rich people or poor people, right? But because she's blind, she can't even see people. And yet she measures people. She judges people according to the calculations in her scales. She makes judgments about people but can't see people. She's like artificial intelligence in that way. And isn't that what terrifies us about AI, artificial intelligence? It's like all knowledge with no soul. And isn't that what terrifies us about courtrooms, politicians and judges, that they might judge us and can't even see us? 
And isn't that what terrifies us about God? That he would judge us and maybe doesn't even see us. Or maybe we can't even truly see ourselves. Well, Lady Justice is a picture of the Roman goddess Justitia. A violent, blind hooker. And she means you get what you pay for. But in our faith, justice means that you get what you don't pay for. You get absolute grace, and he is the wisdom of God and the life of God. The man hanging on this tree sees the people before him. And he forgives all the people that he sees. There are no calculations. They take everything, and he just gives everything. He doesn't simply swing the sword. He is the sword. He's the good that reveals all evil. He's the revelation of the relentless love that is God. The man hanging on this tree in this garden is God's judgment. He is justice, and he means you get what you don't pay for. (laughs) That's grace. So why do we think justice is a harlot? Well, maybe because we're harlots and idolaters. And idolaters always make God in their own image. But hopefully we're beginning to believe that God is making us in his own image, and that's justice. Justice uh, is to make us in his own image, the image of love, free love, unconditional love, non-transactional love, unlimited love. And so, who is the harlot in this picture. And what is wisdom in this picture? Or maybe I shouldn't say what is wisdom, but who is wisdom? You know, for the first 30 some years of my life, the first three chapters of the Bible in Genesis were the most confusing, difficult, and embarrassing aspect of my faith. I was trained as a geologist. so. I knew that the earth was old, at least according to our calculations of space and time. And I thought the idea of God damning humanity to endless hell because thousands of years ago, two naked people who didn't know what was good and wanted to know what was good, and I was told that we should know what was good, the thought of God damning humanity because these two innocent, stupid, naked people were tempted to eat fruit from this utterly confusing tree in a garden that no one seemed capable of locating in space and time. I said, that's just nuts. But for the next 15 years of my life, I had this job in which I was called to preach from Scripture every week. And because I thought that in order to teach, I ought to be taught, I preached through books of the Bible. I preached through Genesis, basically all of the Gospels, and the Revelation. That's the beginning, the revelation of the plot, and the end. I preached through those books, several other books like Ephesians, 1 Peter, Acts, a bunch of other stuff, and, and time and time again, I kept seeing this picture. I didn't actually see this particular picture, but this picture kept coming into focus in my mind, and then all hell started to break loose, (laughs) as if hell really, really does not like this picture. For the following 15 years, I've kind of preached from this picture. Now, I found this picture and several other pictures like it by simply searching the internet, googling pictures of Jesus hanging on a tree in a garden. You see, Scripture makes a big deal out of the fact that the word translated as cross can also be translated timber or tree, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that this tree, which is also just like two trees but one tree, can be found in the middle of a garden, which can be found in the depths of a temple, which is also a door from time into eternity. About eight years ago, with your help, I took my sermons on Genesis chapter 1 and turned them into this book which I titled The History of Time and the Genesis of You. This is the old cover, and this is the new, more conservative, updated cover. In this book, I I make the case that we're all still being created in the sixth day of creation. But at the cross, 
The seventh day, which is God's rest and eternal life. At the cross, God's eternity is implanted in our temporal hearts. The Garden of Eden, that is paradise, and is not simply a place in space and time, but a place at the edge of space and time, outside of space and time, and yet inside of every human heart, the temple of the soul. You know, Solomon wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. In Proverbs, if you've read it, you notice there's a lot of knowledge of good and evil, and a little talk about this lady wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon seems to give up attaining knowledge, and he surrenders to wisdom. We preached through that, remember, for a year. In the Song of Solomon, he just sings about love. Love is strong as death. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. And in the Song of Solomon, there's a garden, and the garden is in his beloved's heart. About seven years ago, and with your help, I took my sermons on Genesis chapter 2 and turned them into this book. I titled it, God and His Sexy Body. Chachi actually made the cover, which I totally love. But the title, Sexy Body, kind of freaks some people out. And uh, so we came up with a, a different cover, a more conservative cover, and, and this title, God and His Body, The Romance of Adam and His Bride. You know, Jesus is called the second Adam, the eschatos Adam. In this book, I point out that at the beginning of the sixth day of creation, which is also the beginning of your life, for you are Adam, Adam couldn't find his helper, his helper who was with him, who is God. God is love and his word is wisdom. And you see the problem? <laughs> right there at the start, Adam is not wise. He doesn't have wisdom. Doesn't even recognize wisdom. So God puts the Adam to sleep and makes him into he and she, that is Adam and Eve, then leaves them alone with this crazy tree in the middle of the garden. When they take the fruit, they become conscious of themselves. They're cast out of paradise and they begin a journey that you now think of as your life. Adam and Eve is, is you. The rest of the Bible is the story of how we come home to God and to ourselves and we know the place for the very first time. The gospel is that although we cannot find the way, the way finds us, for the way is wisdom. And wisdom is our helper, our husband. In other words, this picture is also this picture and lo and behold, he has been with us all along. It's just that we did not have a hearing heart or maybe womb to know and be known by wisdom, the eschatos Adam, our husband. Before I die, I, I hope to write a third book based off the sermons from the third chapter of Genesis. And actually, really, most of the sermons I preached for the last seven years here in in this place, and I want to call it the tree in the middle of the garden, and use um, this picture for, for a cover. Not that one, but this one. It's not time yet, but every time I preach, I can't unsee this picture and this tree, and, and I want you to know that for me, it almost makes preaching impossible. Not because relentless love is such a hard concept to grasp intellectually, but because we all get confused by this. We think God is just, and that justice is a violent, blind harlot swinging a sword. And if God isn't this, we think he's at least in bed with this. So if they say things like God is part love, and part this, part justice. But justice is not this. It's this. And not what we're doing in the picture, which is injustice, bad judgment, and evil, but what he's doing. That's justice. That's good judgment. That's wisdom. That's love. So back to my question. In this picture, who is the harlot? And I mean the great harlot. <laughs> the 
the harlot riding the beast. You know, Scripture is full of talk about harlotry. In the Old Testament, all sin and idolatry is described as harlotry, and God accuses the people of Jerusalem as playing the harlot, his people. In the New Testament, the word that's used, and this is, this is sad, but the word that's usually translated as sexual immorality should be translated harlotry. Harlotry is attempting to buy or sell love as if love were a thing that you could possess, consume, and use like a commodity. So who is the harlot? And where is wisdom? And what is wisdom? Or should I say, who is wisdom? For wisdom, which is good judgment, which is love, is not a what, but a who. Not a thing, but a person who is our husband, and he's hanging on the tree in the garden at the edge of time and eternity like fruit. And wisdom goes by other names, like the way, the truth, the life, and the light. Wisdom is the logic or the logos in everything that's anything. Wisdom is the good, and wisdom is the life, and wisdom is our helper. Wisdom is love in human flesh, who is also our husband. So who's the harlot in this picture? Wouldn't it be all those people at the base of the tree? All those characters from the Bible, and in truth, we're all characters from the Bible, so no matter who you are, Mary Magdalene or Mother Mary, King Saul or King Solomon, Judas or Peter the Pope, we're, we're all the harlot. For all of us have fallen in Adam, who is also Eve. For what is it that happened at the fall? Well, it's what has happened to each one of us in the garden of our own soul. Each one of us has wanted love, right? Each one of us has wanted love, although we did not know what or who love is. We wanted love, and so we took love as if he were a commodity that we could possess. And then maybe when that didn't work, we tried to buy love as if love himself were our harlot and also sell love, which I think is called religion. So let me be blunt. Sin is consuming love and trying to purchase love. Sin is raping love, as if love were your whore. All sin is the crucifixion of the Christ who is love in human flesh. Humanity, that is Adam, who is also Eve, is a harlot. A murdering harlot. And now I'm genuinely embarrassed to say this, but I just finished the introduction to the sermon. <laughs> and we're almost out of time. So perhaps we're going to revisit this next week when we talk about a sex slave named Esther. But for now, I'll just point to the two harlots and raise a few questions. Each one of us is a harlot. But more than a harlot, I think each one of us is two harlots in one house. Just like the two harlots that stood before Solomon 3,000 years ago, and just like Solomon, as he stood before wisdom, enthroned on the ark between the cherubim. So what's the difference between the two harlots? How did Solomon know the difference, and what did he do about it? First, what's the difference? Well, the lying harlot is raping the judge, isn't she? Truth incarnate is on the throne, and what's she doing? She's lying. She's taking truth and using him to create her own reality. She's sacrificing truth in order to save herself. The idol. She's sacrificing the one on the throne to save herself, and she's sacrificing a baby and a mother to herself, her ego. She's not serving the baby. Even if Solomon gave her the baby, the baby's already dead to her. She's revealed that. She doesn't love the baby. She only loves herself, and now herself is a person in which she's trapped, or a prison in which she's trapped. No longer maybe even a person, but a prison. The way she sees the judge, check this out, is the way that she sees the baby, which is the way that she sees all things, and so she's trapped in a world that has died. 
It's all about her. And she's entirely alone in a world where she can no longer hear the music. And you should feel sorry for her because she's like each one of us. But she can't get her baby back by taking more life or crucifying more truth. But what about the honest harlot? Well, she's also a harlot, right? Just like the first. But within her own womb, like a dead seed that has miraculously come to life in the darkest of all soil, in her own womb she has encountered life. And then given birth to that life, And now she's aware that it's not simply her life, but another life to which she is nonetheless forever connected. Her life, not because she owns it, but because she has birthed it. And and, and now she's willing to sacrifice herself to save that life. And because she's now willing to sacrifice herself to save that life, she's also surrendered to the judgment from the throne. And check this out. In the moment of surrender, the moment she yells, give the baby to the other woman, the moment she loses her life, she finds her life and becomes who it is that she truly is, not a harlot, but a bride and a mother. And all of that should sound vaguely familiar to us. It's wisdom on the throne, and the woman gives birth to wisdom, whom she wraps in swaddling clothes, swaddling clothes and places in a manger that is her old self. Jesus is the baby that dies, and Jesus is the baby that rises from the dead within you. Jesus is wisdom incarnate. And he has descended into every place that's no place. (laughs) And like I said, wisdom goes by other names like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, you see, is wisdom incarnate in you. So if you want those things, you can't take those things and pay for those things. You have to enter into a covenant of sacrificial and unlimited love And in that place, ask for wisdom and expose yourself to wisdom and then surrender to wisdom like a bride surrenders to her groom, for that's who you are, the bride of Christ and the mother of Christ. No matter how desolate you feel, that's who you truly are. And just so you know, I believe that Jesus has all the babies But if you want those things, love, joy, peace, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control, you can't manufacture those things. You must give birth to those things because they're not just things. They're eternal life. They're actually your eternal life. Wisdom is not just knowledge that you can just take like a thing, for when you do, you kill him, at least to yourself. And so all the music in your universe dies Wisdom is your husband. And if you ask for wisdom, he'll give you wisdom. It may take some time, and you will experience some travail, but you will give birth to wisdom and a universe of ecstatic delight. Like I said, wisdom goes by many names, but wisdom is not simply whomever you happen to want him to be. And yet, once you've seen wisdom, don't be surprised to find him any place in every place, for he's the good in anything that's good. And he's the life in all that's living, and maybe everything is actually alive. One of my favorite names for wisdom is the Logos. And you see, it's the Logos that is the logic behind all reality, like the rhythm of a song. And that means reality itself is the manifestation of music that comes from your lover's mouth, and one day you will hear it all the time. And everywhere you go, even in busy metro stations at 8 in the morning on a winter morning in Washington, D.C., one day you'll hear all creation singing. And everything that you do will manifest that song as a dance. For at the tree in the garden, God has given you a heart. A heart that hears. 
And when you worship in spirit and truth, it's starting to happen even here, even now. I once heard a missionary say, when a European, and I think he also meant American, wants to know something, he takes it apart. But when an African wants to know something, he dances with it. Maybe Jesus is inviting you to dance all the time. Brennan Manning used to tell about this retreat he once led that included a great deal of sharing, except on the part of this one nun who wouldn't smile, sing, laugh, or cry. One woman who wouldn't even speak. On the afternoon of the fourth day, he asked everyone to share what God had been doing on the retreat in their lives, and the silent nun reached for her journal, and then she said this, something happened to me yesterday. It was after you spoke on the fact that Jesus is a husband and quoted St. Augustine, who said he is the best husband. Then she read from her journal, at the end of your talk, you prayed that we might experience what you had just shared. You asked us to close our eyes. Almost the moment I did, something happened. In faith, I was transported into a large ballroom filled with people. I was sitting by myself in, in a wooden chair when, when a man approached me, took me by the hand, and led me onto the floor. He held me in his arms and led me in the dance. The tempo of the music increased, and we whirled faster and faster. The man's eyes never left my face. His radiant smile covered me with warmth, delight, and a sense of acceptance. Everyone else on the floor stopped dancing. They were staring at us. The beat of the music increased, and we pirouetted around the room in reckless rhythm. I glanced at his hands, and then I knew. Brilliant wounds of a battle long ago almost like a signature carved in flesh. The music tapered to a slow, lilting melody, and Jesus rocked me back and forth. As the dance ended, he pulled me close to him. Do you know what he whispered? Christine, I am wild about you. <laughs> That's wisdom. That's wisdom speaking to Christine and Christine giving birth to wisdom and speaking wisdom into you and into me like a seed into broken and dirty soil. And so on the night that wisdom was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup saying, this is the covenant, like a marriage covenant. This is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Brown cups are wine. Blue cups are juice. And this is wisdom. Amen. You have called us chosen for your kingdom, unashamed to call us your own. We are your beloved. And so you just said that to the Lord. But maybe you kind of sang it like a song because you're supposed to sing it. So right now, even though it feels weird, and you think, well, that can't actually be true, just, just say, confess the truth in your heart right now. Say, I am your beloved. Do you realize that? Well, did you say it? Whether you said it or not, it's true. And you were always his beloved. And you always be his beloved. You just haven't known it. Because you weren't wise. <laughs> but he makes you wise. Lord, we sang that line that you paid my ransom. 
And I know that theologians have argued about that verse for a couple thousand years, asking, well, who did you pay the ransom to? Did you pay it to the devil? Did you pay it to yourself, God, because you're justice? Jesus, I thank you paid it to each one of us because we've made an idol <laughs> out of our concept of justice. And so we are our own prisoners and we are trapped within ourselves, the illusions that we have to pay for your love, that we have to create ourselves. And Lord, it's because I live in that illusion so much of the time that I, I steal love, I take love, I try to purchase love. I always walk around scared like hell that I have not been loved. And, but Jesus, you paid the ransom. You enter the prison and you give us yourself. Because you're good and you're the life. It's in your name that we thank you. Amen. So just stay like you are for a minute. I just want to say that I don't think Solomon was being clever. I used to always think he was being clever, you know. I don't think that was how he knew the lying harlot from the honest harlot. I think the wisdom in him recognized the wisdom in her. Wisdom always manifests in a crisis and sacrifices itself because that's who wisdom is. And what did he do about it once he saw it? Well, he didn't have to do anything because, you see, it was already done. The word of truth silenced the lying harlot and restored the loving mother. And so what should you do about it? Well, you should bring your two harlots in the one house that is you you should bring them to worship every week and uh, maybe every day and even every moment and just abide in the presence of wisdom. And you will give birth to good judgments as good judgments give birth to you. For in reality, all right, in reality, which is eternity, you're not a harlot. You're a bride and a mother giving birth right now. So by way of benediction in Jesus' name, and this is a blessing, but it's also a commandment, believe the gospel. Amen.